Hello, welcome. This is everything slightly today. Stephen Roach of Makers and Mystics fame. Guys, huge podcast, beautiful work. He's also, well, he sort of runs the community called uh, The Breath and the Clay. And today we talk about the liminal and we talk about what art is and how it works. And he offers a sort of a look from the edge. This world-class musician helps us understand sort of how it works in his world when it comes to fulfillment and spiritual heights. And he may be joining us in Washington for the Art of the Tamada. Guys, Jonathan Pajot will be joining us for the Florida event. That's November 7, 8, 9, 10. He has confirmed. So, we still have tickets for Florida where he will join Jordan Hall and we'll have a party at the Art of the Tamada. This is First Things Foundation, heavy things lightly. So, hey, everybody. Uh, heavy things lightly today, Stephen Roach. Stephen, first of all, let's just plug it right now. I was on your show, and I don't know when comparatively to this moment, um, but we already had a really good conversation, and now I have the pleasure of bringing you on Heavy Things Lightly uh, from, I guess, Virginia, right? Are you North Carolina. North Carolina, that's right. So East Coast. Yeah. East Coast. We're together on timing anyway. The world is crazy. Uh, <laughs> it's crazy. I'm going to do a couple pods from, from Mozambique. Don't try to figure it out, Stephen. Uh, wow. <laughs> uh, so let's, guys, this is Stephen. We're going to get into his work with uh, Makers and Mystics and the Breath and the Clay. And I want to make a toast to you. Mm. I don't know if you're drinking anything. I don't care. Forgive me. I didn't get you ready for this. <laughs> You can no drink worries. water. I'm drinking some sort of Zevia or something. Everyone's like, that stuff's going to kill you. I don't care. It might. Uh, <laughs> Zevia is like some kind of diet drink. So I just want to say this. Uh, our work got put together through a friend of ours. So I want to toast to, uh, to everyone in the world, in every moment in the world, when you think you know what's going to happen but you actually don't always say the good thing like our friend did. Mm. And when you say the good thing, the potential thing, it starts to be put into reality. And so now we have a friendship because of our friend. So this is to the moments when we act like we don't know what's going to happen because we don't. So we should yes. always offer the good things. Gagi Marjos in the tradition of the Georgian Gagi Marjos. Right. Yes, yes. Yeah. Drink it. <laughs> So heavy things lightly. Um, you do heavy things. You try to bring something like an intersection, um, uh, some sort of relationship between art, faith, and culture. Would you just tell me if it's possible? Can you find that today in our world? You know, that is the quest that I've been on since about 2016 is, is looking for that sweet spot between it and, uh, you know, my curiosity increases. I don't know if my solutions or conclusions increase much, but I'm I'm still curious enough to continue chasing that question, you know. Yeah, like what do you when you see an intersection, a proper intersection. So if people you're a musician, so I want to get into that too because I notice you play a lot of different instruments. You have instrumentality as I've been told by one of my kids who's a musician <laughs> does is there a moment when you feel that the art something like the faith and something like um personal culture is there a high is there a a moment of of feeling is it a moment is it a rational moment when you feel these mm -hmm. things come together and you're doing something good how, how do you recognize this yeah. intersection well I think maybe a good place to dive in would be just this idea of transcendence or this idea of flow state. And mm. I'm sure you're familiar with flow state, but it's something that athletes as well as musicians and artists experience when they kind of, they hit that sweet spot where they get outside of their own technical ability and then something deeper kind of takes over, mm. you know? And what I've found is that even though the language may be different, 
between certain faith expressions and certain creative expressions, the aim is very central to both efforts. And it is connecting with something greater than yourself. It is kind of getting outside of yourself and understanding like our part in the whole scheme of things, if that makes sense, you know? And so for me, I didn't grow up in a religious context per se. Um, for me, music and art really was a religious expression early on, even though I didn't know to name it that, mm. you know, and then as my own spiritual journey and my own creative journey developed in my adult life, I started seeing so many similarities and, and so many places of overlap and, and some, you know, sometimes it would feel like they were in competition and didn't understand. And then other times it would feel like these, um, these similar expressions would work in concert together to kind of lift the spirit of the listener or the viewer or the audience, you know, the participant. And so that is what drives that curiosity for me. And one of the beautiful things about what we're doing is that there's so much nuance to how you can understand that experience and, and how many different uh, ways that you can encounter that intersection. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll throw one at you. I know that you have an Eastern Orthodox background. Well, I just attended my first Pascha ever. Is that right? Is that and right? I, you know, I had, uh, I'd never been to anything like that, but for me, it was transformative because I, I recognize at least for me coming in from this outside perspective, I didn't walk into what necessarily felt like a church service. I walked into a happening. I walked into a movement. I walked into this dramatized liturgy that I just got swept up in. Yeah. And, uh, and for me, it was a very uh, creative. It led to a lot, of, a lot of creative resonance in my own life, just being in that environment. So I don't know. That might have been a bit of a rabbit trail, but that's no. kind of how I get at these things. I think it's a... – well, first of all, by referencing your sort of – where you're coming from, your first Pascha, that helps my audience. Yeah. Cause you know what we do, right? Not we, everybody. We always clamor for context. It's like one of the great rules of writing, I, I, I'm a, I like to think I'm a writer, mm -hmm. is the great authors always say, on the first page, make sure you give them where they are. You have to give the reader a sense of where they are. That's right. Like, is this yesterday? Is it tomorrow? What, what the heck is going on? So I think it happens on podcasts too. You just gave us, okay, now where you are. Now, I don't think you've identified fully who you are, mm -hmm. but it helps us to see like, oh, okay, so this brother's coming, okay, from this angle. So let's pick that up though, a happening. So do you think, for me, liturgy, it's like all leading to this moment. So if you notice Pascha, depending how long you, you could tough it out because it's like three hours. <laughs> yeah, that's right. If, but if you notice the rhythm, and I mean rhythm, like don't, don't, don't. The whole thing is don't. It's heading toward yeah. communion. But if you use that word or if you hear that word communion as communion, then you and I are communing on our way to the communion. Mm -hmm. And that whole thing feels something like, for me anyway, when I take communion, something like flow state. Mm -hmm. But is it, because some of the listeners here who call themselves Orthodox would be like, you can't really equate flow state with uh, the acceptance <laughs> of Christ into your very being. And so I wonder, how would you do that in your own mind? Like, are they the same thing or can you even know or how, how would you? parse this yeah it's a it's a very broad question mm. you know and but i again my background is musical and so that is probably where i've experienced what i would consider the flow state more than any other place and that is when you mention that rhythm my background is percussion primarily i've studied uh classical indian percussion west african and middle eastern percussion most of my life and there's something about the rhythm that when it just gets attuned to your own heart rhythm, it, it makes it uh, effortless, if yeah. that makes sense. And I, and I do find that very much um, in times of worship, when I've been in times of worship in various places, whether it's been musical or other. And so 
how that overlaps and how that intersection, uh, where that intersection occurs, it's kind of the basis of my study. And I know, you know, I don't know how deep into like scriptural references and things like that, that you want to go, but you can, you can find beautiful examples of that all throughout one, one that I think is fun is, um, in the book of Samuel, when the musical band of prophets are coming down the mountain and they're, they're just, I just get this image of these like gypsy kind of hippie vibe, Mm -hmm. but like super deep kind of, you know, figures playing their instruments coming down. And it said that when Saul got in that swirl, that he became a different man. Hmm. He became a different person. And, you know, I mean, we're off into the deep end already. We're five minutes into the interview talking yeah, yeah. about <laughs> experiential things, you know, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, and, um, but there's a beauty to that that doesn't have to be woo woo ungrounded or right, even new agey. Right. Uh, you know, that's not what I'm suggesting. I'm not suggesting a, a, a new agey ungrounded kind of thing, but it's actually a very grounded experience, especially when it comes from a deep tradition like Eastern Orthodox and like mm-hmm. what you you're doing in your life. I, I think a lot of people listening to this would say that that's what's happened to them is mm-hmm. I like the way you say it. it's not woo woo, but there was something about the rhythm and the pay and there's something about the invitation at the liturgy that was like whole or fulfilling. And so, so you've cultivated this hope to have a conversation by creating a podcast, but to have a conversation about this intersection mm-hmm. guys, this is a really good podcast that he has. And it's also like, you've done a lot of them. Like you're a pro, you know what I mean? So <laughs> I talk a lot. <laughs> I, well, I don't know. That's what my, I think you actually listen a lot. So listening and empathy, they seem to be at the heart of your work. Um, that's right. Why, why not? Why not command and control, bro? Like, yeah. Cause I think all music begins with listening and I think, all art begins with contemplation. And I think that if we want to reach the heart of another person, we have to cultivate that art of listening. And I think maybe it's that punk rock inside of me that wants, that always gravitates toward the countercultural, but I don't think enough of us are cultivating the art of listening these days. And so for me, I'm always searching not for the discord or the things that I can point out that's wrong or different, or I don't agree with that. No, I'm, I'm actually looking for the common thread. I'm, mm. I'm, I'm looking for that common ground because nine times out of 10, even those guests that I have on my show that I don't see eye to eye with on a lot of things, I can find one common thread and we can build friendship from there. And I, and I tend to think that in some context, belonging, precedes believing even i think that there's there's something where creating a sense of community um at least in this context you know maybe that's not true in every context but creating a sense of camaraderie i let that take front seat over ideology you know and and there's just something about cultivating the art of listening where i mean you know i am a i am a person of faith but man some of my atheist friends have taught me more about faith yeah. than they ever intended to teach me. <laughs> you know, it, it. So this is a, this is actually one of my questions. In that sense, is there such a thing as atheism? So, so mm. there may be a professed. I don't think there is a spaghetti monster god in the sky. I'm cool. I get that. I don't think there is either. But if an atheist fully articulating Let's just say that there's no meaning beyond the grave, whatever atheism is. At the same time, they're turning around and giving you a poem of music or a poem of words or a, you know, a, 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 a fusillade of words that are beautiful. Haven't they expressed something higher than themselves? And at that point, isn't that their worship? Isn't that their God on some level? That doesn't mean that their God is like, equal to my God, but don't they have one at that point? I think that, I think that many of them would be closer than they would know, Mm. you know? And I think, I think you're right. I'm not so sure that there is a true atheist at heart. I think that, you know, uh, 
you can be anti-religious. I get that. Right, uh, right. You, you can totally right. be anti-religious. But the funny thing about atheism is that it's it's built on a negative. And so from the outset, atheism can't exist unless the God they want to deny is present. <laughs> <laughs> and so it kind of it kind of chases its own tail in my view you know it's if there was no god to deny you could not have this structure the, and, uh, uh, the other thing for me is at some point probably around the i don't know what you musicians call around maybe around the mixing board or whatever uh, in the studio or for me at the restaurant um, it's around the table, the super table, or around the hearth. At some point, that distinction doesn't matter. Yes. Like, like, okay, great. And also, here's a toast to family. Like, yes, I, you have one of those, and I have one of those. Yes. You know? Again, that's finding the common ground, and and uh, that's you know, I, I love even the story you shared on Makers and Mystics in our conversation together, just about what happened around the table between the, uh, the military, the vet, yeah, um, yeah. and you know, the transitioning person and just that beautiful story. We won't tell it here. We'll, we'll have everybody go listen to it. I there, probably but... told it. People are like, <laughs> no, not that again, Lord. <laughs> right. You know, um, but I think that that's what creativity does. And I think that that's what, uh, sets, what we're doing apart a little bit because some people have um, thought of us as a church community, uh, which we're not exactly. Other people have thought of us as an art community, which we kind of are. <laughs> mm -hmm. But creativity tends to be that intersection point and the human experience or culture, the human experience tends to be that intersection point where we can all talk about grief. We can all talk about family. We can all talk about loss. We can all talk about love. We can all talk about these things that bring us together and maybe it's on a very wide level, but when I meet people on that ground and I give them the honor and respect of cultivating the art of listening to their story, their mm -hmm. perspective, then I also build relational equity for me to be able to speak my experience mm -hmm. with them uh, and to them. And so that's, that's really, um, you know, what is at the heart of it for me is, is finding that common ground, uh, building on it, honoring the differences. You know, some people, some people think that unless you agree on everything, you shouldn't even be talking to one another. I've had people that have, uh, you know, gotten upset with me because maybe I had somebody on my podcast from a Buddhist background, or maybe I had somebody on my podcast, you know, from whatever background, you know, triggers your Orthodox. <laughs> yeah, orthodox. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but having conversations with people that, that disagree with you or see the world differently than you doesn't mean that you lack conviction. So and that it, was one of my yeah. questions. Do you feel um, – I, I, I fall for this too. I'll, I'll describe it as I understand it, and then you tell me what you think. You, you know, taffy? Like, you mean, have you ever like eaten candy? taffy? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Candy. So – you take taffy, you hold it in one and you, you know, the ends in your thumbs, and then you start to pull. You can pull pretty far, but if you pull too far, now the taffy's starting to fall apart. And then <laughs> right. now you got two different disparate pieces of gooeyness. And sometimes when I'm talking to folks, I feel like I, I risk breaking the taffy. In other words, losing my integrity. Yeah. Because like you have a body that's not mine and you have an ending point that's Steven that's not my beginning point. We do have it. How do you deal with not losing your integrity as you start to enter into a deep relationship with people who may or may not ultimately have the same truth? How do you do that? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that first and foremost, even when I was talking about transcendence earlier, I, I think that you know, we can only experience things that are greater than ourselves when we have a root. And so for mm -hmm. me, that root is my faith, that that root is um, I am the beloved, that root is uh, my relationship with the creator um, from the Christian story. You know, that's where I'm, that's where I am. That's my point of gravity. Mm -hmm. 
you know, um, that's my fixed point from which I see the rest of the world. And so my responsibility is to stay centered in that, that truth, that reality every day of my life, whether it's through prayer, contemplation, devotion, other spiritual discipline, community with other like-minded people, folks that can help sharpen me. And so from that fixed point, I can begin to engage those differences without compromising my own conviction or without feeling the need to uh, decimate other belief systems or things that, that don't align with that. Now, uh, that's not to say that, you know, I think at some point, you know, the relationships only go as deep as they go. And I mean, some of the folks that we just resonate with and see eye to eye with, we're we're going to, we're going to hit deeper strides, I think. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but yeah. that doesn't mean that everybody is meant to be my best friend, you know, but I can, I can still create a sense of community and engage in the larger culture, um, by showing up to the conversation and bringing who I am and, uh, and looking for that common ground. Does the artist community easily understand that position these days? How did, how, how has our culture that's getting more and more polarized. Does does your huge community that you work with, do they speak like you still, or did they fall prey to some of this polarity, or what do you think? Sure. No, I, I think that um, that's why the work in front of me is so great, is because of the polarity. And unfortunately, and I don't even mean this in a faith context, I just mean this in the world at large, in the art world at large, you know, unfortunately, a lot of art, modern art, falls prey to propaganda. Mm -hmm. A lot of modern art that I see, it's based more on did we check the right virtue signal in our art? And do you know by the content I've created where I stand on this political issue? Right. That that seems to be more important to some people than the content of the art or the the, the artistic excellence, you know, that's – uh, that created the piece. And that's very troubling to me. I think now, you know, looking into the faith community that the faith community has its own set of criteria that if you don't check those boxes, you're usually, that's uh, an interesting it, point. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're Everybody's right. got their own, their own boxes that they're, they're wanting everybody else to check. And I think the thing that's um, maddening for some people is that I, I don't, I don't easily like to check those boxes and again I, I, maybe it's just uh the mischief i don't know i don't think i'm a provocate uh pro, how you say that provocateur is that a provocateur word? yeah 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 you know i don't i don't mean to be i don't i don't but mean to do we this may thing. be coming provocateurs because it may be that so many people have moved to the polls that just to try to synthesize becomes a type of pro provocation that's right it really is. And I, you know, I've kind of come up with my own little term for that and I call it the radical middle. And that's so weird because we're calling it a hospitality as rebellion, which is yeah. <laughs> it's right. kind of the same concept. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Because who should you have in your home? So this is a theme we're working with, with our Art of Tamana fundraisers, which is who should you have in your home? And then obviously the Christian message is, is the neighbor. Who's your neighbor? Everybody. Oh, everybody's welcome in my home. Correct. Even the guy, as the Georgians say, who wants to kill you. First you feed him. Then if he's still trying to kill you, you fight him. <laughs> right. For real. Yeah. Like, You're right. what if we yes. actually did that? That's yes. an act of provocation, man. Maybe we just have to own it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting for me because I'm going to take, a again, a very familiar scriptural reference and it's Psalm 23 when it talks about the table. You set a table before me in the presence of my enemies, right? I used to get the visual of that was, you know, all of these enemies are around with weapons and snarling and you're sitting peaceful at this table right, while right. all the enemies like, are surrounding, you know. Right, right. But then it just occurred to me one day uh, in the presence of my enemies, perhaps that's because the enemies are actually sitting at the table with yeah, you they are it's a completely different image and i think with the work that you're doing you know maybe even that that goes into what you're talking about i i steven i can't i'm telling you this is why we connected and again we got to thank vesper because <laughs> because 
you described how uh, sometimes I don't fit. People don't understand on either side kind of what I'm trying. I think when you're over the target in this culture, in the Western culture in 2024, it should be that most people don't fully understand what you're doing. Yeah. And and in, in orthodoxy, we call that where you see a lot of paradox, you probably see a lot of truth because God became man. What? Like try to figure that out. Like you won't. Like you don't get to figure that out. So the paradox is sometimes often a marker of reality. Mm -hmm. And so where I'm both talking to a Muslim and then I'm talking to Stephen Roach, who's, you know, some sort of evangelical, whatever. (laughs) And then I'm talking to my brother, who's pretty clearly an Orthodox ascetic type. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Like, right. You have to have a, why? Like, why not? Like, why not? I, what's going to happen? I'm going to be associated. I'm, it's going to rub off on me. Your even, You rubbed your evangelical <laughs> stuff off on me. Like, it's weird, right? Sorry, yes. I'm, I'm going on a screed. But. No, it's great. I've never been called an evangelical before, though. <laughs> well, whatever you are. Because, see, one of my questions was about to be, so what the hell are you? Like, I'm not kidding. <laughs> I'm not good. That's great. Yeah. So what the Uh, hell are you? Go ahead. Watch. It's 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 gonna matter and it's also not gonna matter. Go ahead. What the hell are you? So how do you are you is it a Baptist tradition? What do you think it is? Yeah, I don't know. I think maybe I'm a um I'm about half Eastern Orthodox, half hippie, half um half mystic with a splash of um Southern heathen. It's perfect. <laughs> no, but it's it's true. You know, I, I, I can we can we make that the clip, Andrew? Andrew's our editor. I want Southern Heathen in there. There you go. There you go. You know. But I would I would say this, you know, it's you know, it would I I don't want to be so presumptuous to say that, oh, I'm a mystic. I think other people could call me a mystic if they want to. I'll leave that up for them to decide. I won't be so presumptuous as to call myself that. But I would say that I aspire to be one. Hmm. And what I mean by that, you know, because even that word mystic is very polarizing. You know, when I I put the, the name out there, makers and mystics, which is all about that intersection of the spiritual life and the creative life, I put it out there. Some people get it. They begin to think of Julian of Norwich. They think of Mm -hmm. Teresa of Avila. They think of Meister Eckert. They think of these people in in the Christian tradition. You could probably speak of a lot of Eastern Orthodox. We could throw some in, 100%. Absolutely. Other people uh, start thinking of psychics or they think of New Age practices or they think of tarot cards or things like that. And that's not... That's not where I'm at. That's that's not my path. That's, That's not where I'm coming from with that word mystic. But what the word mystic means for me is someone who is not satisfied knowing about God or ultimate reality. But the mystic for me is someone who wants to find that communion, wants to find that union in every part of life, whether it's experiential or whether it's intellectual, emotional, relational, every part of it. I'm, I'm, on, a, I'm, I'm on a journey to experience that communion in every part of who I am. And then from that place, I want to live a creative life and I want to, I want to, uh, I want to leave the world better than I found it through creativity, you know? It's so nice. Yeah. There's something, do you know what Troy Palomalu is? I don't. He's a football player. He played for, uh, Pittsburgh Steelers. He's world-class all pro and hall of fame, uh, and also Orthodox. And if you ever caught him on the field, he'd just suddenly be crossing himself, giving yeah. the sign of the cross. And then I looked into it and I've heard him talk and he's, he, he goes to all the monasteries and uh, he's a real faithful guy. Like, yeah. And one of the interesting things is that he talks about how, how excellence is just its own entity. Oh, I love that. It And right. And he, he was like, I just want to figure out how to be excellent. So when, he was introduced into orthodoxy, what he saw was a tradition of excellence, like Mm. a tradition of highness. I I like that word. It's old, you know, your highness, Mm -hmm. but that which is high, that which is all the way at the top. And so this cat has been running around top speeds on a football field where you can get hurt badly. Yeah. 
and managing his existence at this high level. And so he was just drawn to the tradition of what's a saint. Yeah. And if you peel away the all the layers of cultural baggage that go with that word through these fights, internecine fights with Christian between Christians, it's that which is high, that 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 which needs to be elevated, and literally like put in a painting and put high. Like that's what it, if you go to a church, <laughs> they're put high. You yeah, know? and you're like that's high, and then wait, I'm low. Ah, I have to climb. And this cat, what I love about Troy Palomalu is he sees that that these are not distinctions and separations. They're actually what life is. Isn't mm. it crazy? Yes. It's, wow. It's, it's attempting to take your beautiful percussion and then unite it at the highest level with all the things that are high. Yeah. And so to do that, you better be pretty good at tapping on the drum. I mean, you got to <laughs> like the technical part has to happen, but yes. that's the beginning. And that's how I feel about your work. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate that. And, you know, I would I would add to that, you know, that the artistic excellence and the technical side of the creative process for artists specifically, but for all of our work, it really is for the purpose of giving us a broader language that we can we mm -hmm. can describe the higher things that we want to talk about you know for me it's like i want to learn my instruments well so that when the moment comes that i want to go off the page here we are back to the flow state mm -hmm. that i have developed a language that can carry the weight of that higher experience that makes sense that's really cool mm -hmm. it's it's really perfectly said. It's like I can't climb higher if I don't have a steady, a steady stairwell to climb. That's right. I, I got to create the that, that steady stairwell. You know. Yeah, and that's that grounding I mentioned earlier. It's like we have to have that groundedness. I was gonna, I was gonna start a band, a little indie rock band one time called Kites and Anchors. <laughs> oh, I, I never like did that. it. So your listeners Great can't name. steal the name. <laughs> well, okay, good. You put it out there. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's no, good. You but know, I think. It yeah. does resemble the prayer life, bro, uh, in, mm -hmm. in the Orthodox East, because you'll always hear a good priest or nun or spiritual father, if you're asking for advice, they're like, well, how about this? Try four minutes first. Just yeah. get up, do four minutes. Come back to me. Because <laughs> yes. four minutes of tapping on the drum, uh, you know, I'm not, that's not what you're doing, but you are, four minutes is better than three. And when you start to pray for four minutes, 40 becomes possible, you know? Um, yes. But 40 is not possible if you can't do four. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I had someone, uh, a mentor said to me one time, uh, he said, you know, at first, five minutes is going to feel like five hours. It's it's just going to be insane. But eventually, five hours is going to feel like five minutes. Wow. And you're you there. Know, it, it's happened it's to you, happened. right? Yeah. I would I would think, well, I've been following this path for for a long time for a very long time, you know, and I did, I did come to faith early in my twenties. And, uh, so I've been, I've been on the journey for quite a while, you know, in many different iterations, but, um, you know, it's been a beautiful, wild, chaotic, mysterious thing. <laughs> and now you, you tell people about it with breath in the clay and then the podcast. Can you tell me just to have a little fun? Yeah. Has there been a jam session or a concert or just, I don't care backyard where you were playing with somebody that sticks out and you're like, and you can name them. I'm not saying they're all famous, this, just whoever they are. But was there a time when that was heavy and strong? It, it, it was a, it was a get down. It was a jam. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, there's, there's so many, but I, you know, just for some context, my family are, it's a, a large family of bluegrass musicians. So, my dad was the third generation fiddle player from Appalachian Mountains. My mom was one of 15 kids. She had six brothers and they were all bluegrass oh, pickers. Um, one of my cousins, some of your listeners would probably recognize the name Tony Rice. He was a very innovative flat picking guitar player. He played with Jerry Garcia, you know, Alison Krauss, lots of folks like that. So, and then uh, one of my co-writers that I've wrote, written with for years is Luke Skaggs. And of course he's the son 
of Ricky Skaggs, who yeah. is a, a really famous uh, mandolin bluegrass player. So mm -hmm. um, that's kind of where I came from. Um, how you go from bluegrass to playing world music is, yeah, yeah. is its is its own journey. But you know, again, for me, uh, you talk about is there a, is there a particular experience? For some reason, this one jumps out to me because it ties into the rest of our conversation. And we were way outside of our context. Um, I normally didn't perform in like uh, alternative spiritual gatherings or new age gatherings or things mm -hmm. like that. I, we, you know, we'd play in concert halls and lots of different places. But we were invited to play at this little new age retreat one night. And uh, so we went and played. We went and played. And we have this practice that we called tuning the room. Okay. And so tuning the room for us is when we'll go in and we just hover on the one note. It's just like one single mm. note and we just like clear out everything and we just go there. And then from that place, uh, we just enter into our music, which has a lot of improvisation to it, uh, but it's very much an act of worship. It's very much a deeply spiritual thing for us, you know, from our context, from mm -hmm. our point of view. And we were totally in a context that did not share that with us at all. But at the end of our performance, several of one of the shamans and one of the other folks uh, came up to us in tears and they said, yeah. your music has healed my heart tonight. And and there was something that happened that was beyond my knowing. I can't explain it to you today any better than what I just did. But all I know is that we showed up in the fullness of who we were. That's right. Without, That's right. Yeah. You know, without trying to be something we weren't. We brought who we were, and it led to one of the most beautiful memories that I have of when I was touring that's, with that band. That's a nice. That's a nice memory. Yeah, yeah. Because this is how I always felt, and this is super cliche, but it's just a gift. Mm -hmm. So I don't have that gift to offer of of harmony through playing an instrument. Yeah. Now, there's other ways we harmonize as human beings, you know, around but, that table. Yeah, that's right. I'll take that because that's it. right now. I just I'm overwhelmed with what it's doing to me mm. as Tomada. But um, we we do offer harmony. There, there's an old idea in the East that each of us is a priest, and the priest stands between the world that we know, the material world, or the fallen world, and the world that we once knew. Yeah, and that that role of the priest of you mm -hmm. but it's it's right it's it's image and iconography is there's a priest then there's a priest and then there's a priest like the high priest christ yeah but all of us stand something like between it almost like a lens and we're supposed to take that light from that world we once knew mm -hmm. and shine it into this world and that's the that's the harmony that's mm -hmm. harmonizing that's to take what was and make it what is. And, and you have to do that by harmonizing. Yeah. Um, and I just think that's what we all do, but I don't know that people agree with, I think they think it's a lot of yada, yada. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know, I, I totally understand, but I think it's interesting. You, you said something that stood out to me. You said that the priest stands between and if you even look at the at the names of my organization, Breath and Clay, mm -hmm. Makers and Mystics, there's something of this word and, you know, that it's this liminal space where I think, I mean, you know, let me just read this to you. I was writing this yesterday. Please, this, please. Is a, this is a sneak peek um, that's going to be, I think, in a book that I'm writing. But it's about the word and, and it says... And suggest that there is more to the story. It paves the way for connection, for addition. It tells us that where we have been is not where we will remain. And invites us into a new and open space, pregnant with possibility. And creates a moment of curiosity, a gaze into the unknown future. And is a prophetic word stretching beyond the limitations of the present and joins two ideas together into one wow, wow. therefore and is a covenantal word it honors distinction yet builds bridges across a chasm of individual thoughts and is the voice of liminal space 
the gap between any given constituents. And um, I'm working on that Bravo. right now, man. I'm pretty pleased with that one. But you should it's, be. You know, it's, but it's about, you know, many artists find ourselves often in that liminal space. You know, that liminal space between this and that liminal space between that. And, and, um, and so that's really at the heart of it is I, I think at the heart of it, I want to abide at the center, but then help the folks that yeah, are in that's that right. liminal space. You know? You're because of my way, my, my brain works. You just do this with me for one second, theology mm -hmm. and anthropology. So a proper, I would say Christian understanding it, it really applies to other some other faiths but let's just do christian yeah what is a man what is anthros what is so the anthropology the study of anthros it tends to limit man to animal in the modern world like he's either this animal or this animal or he's not a little bit of angel and a little bit of animal it, <laughs> science tends to do aristotelian black and whites mm. and what I, what I want to say is, is I think a proper starting point, a proper anthropology, a, a way to understand man is as theanthropology. So theos, the Greek for God. So you are both God and man. Mm -hmm. And I say that because Christ is both God and man and you're in that image. So then if you think about that, your beautiful exposition on and it might be that it's properly aligned with reality. Mm -hmm. It might be that your description is touching because it's asking me to recognize reality, not, not truth. That's true. But reality, for instance, like if you drive according to your own desires on a certain kind of road at a certain kind of speed, reality will make life hard on you. Because <laughs> <laughs> yes. you will go off the road. And I wonder if we all operate according to a certain type of anthropology that we're animals. Mm -hmm. Life might become really hard for us because we're not in alignment with reality. What reality is, is that mystically, we're both and. Mm -hmm. Not I love it. one or, yeah. you know. Yeah, I mean that. I think you described the breath and the clay uh, more succinctly than I ever have. No, and, and no. it is <laughs> it is that that anthropology, you know. Um, and even you know, again, coming at the heart of the Christian faith, you know, Jesus is all God, all man. He, it's, at the it's, same it's, time, figure yes, it out, or don't. Right. You won't. But. <laughs> <laughs> That's the mystery, though. That's the mystery. Rich. Which is your work, man. So mm -hmm. let, let's end with this. Um, like, are you on the edge? Are you the tip of the spear? Or do you think that we won't, your creating of community, your ability to, to try to unite art and these deep mystical ideas with culture, do you think that's coming as a normality? Or do you think, sadly, we're leaving that? that world and moving closer to something like hyper individuality and, and a technocracy or something. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> both and. Uh, both and. That's right. Uh, but I mean that, yes, both and, um, you know, I do see a lot of, you know, again, the polarization, um, expressive individualism, hyper individualism is, is a huge, is a huge thing. Now, when I was growing up, you know, the things that I thought were the fringe have now become the mainstream. Yeah. And I think that that's something that you see across the generations, you know, but for me, I'm also seeing because of deconstruction, a lot of people that have left the faith, there's a lot of orphaned believers out there, or there's a lot of people yeah. that, that they have a sense or an intimation about something, or maybe they have a deep relationship spiritually, but they don't know where they belong communally. And so part of our work is not just bridging the gap between differing perspectives. It is that, but it is also giving space for people to come together in a common context. You know, I say uh, you're in a safe place to have more questions than answers. You're in yeah. a safe place, you know, to be in process 
And again, I want to emphasize that doesn't mean that we lack conviction. It means that because we have conviction, we can stand in that space. That's right. You know, and so I think really, um, I think that artists, and I consider you an artist, um, we're all artists in our own rights. We're all creative because we were created in the image of a creator, however that plays out. I think that we are the architects of hope for our generation yeah. and for the generations to come. I don't know how much of this work I'll see come to pass in my lifetime, but I know that I'll continue to work toward it. And then hopefully I've lit enough of a spark that somebody else can pick it up where I leave off and take it further than I ever do. Well, it's going to happen. You're, mm -hmm. you've, the people that I know that know you guys check out his work. And um, also you said something like maybe you'll come to the restaurant. Oh, you're driving distance, my friend. <laughs> I know. We got to do it. We got to do it. Absolutely. Let's because make it happen. Because let's set up a weekend. We'll kind of, we'll bill it as sort of like a music weekend at KP. Mm. And we'll figure out how to get everybody compensated with lots of cheese bread and delicious stuff. And, and maybe three or four of you guys or 10 or 20 just come and hang out. We'll figure it out. And we have a lawn right in front of our... It's really a cool place for music. It would be uh -huh. very easy to do and uh, spend the night. First of all, we do a big feast. And then the next day we do lots of music all day long. I, it's, it's, it's about that far. And if you're not yeah. watching this, guys, it's my two fingers almost exactly together. Uh, so that's our next thing. Okay. June, you have to come find me in Mozambique or Georgia. I, uh -huh. I'm like off the table. But I say we talk about it, brother. Oh, uh, yeah. That sounds beautiful. That sounds beautiful. I'm into it. Okay. Anything you want anybody else to know before we hang up? Because this was great. I could keep going, but we can't because I'm told by <laughs> Andrew, our editor, they will stop listening at one hour. <laughs> no, that's great. No, I think it's wonderful. I appreciate the work that you're doing, and I'd love for people to be able to find me through Makers and Mystics or The Breath and the Clay as well. Uh, we're on Instagram at Makers and Mystics and The Breath and the Clay. That's a okay, good way cool. to keep up with me. All right, guys, this is Steven. Uh, we'll see you soon. And I'm I'm finding a way to even see if you can get out to Washington to our Art of Tama. I have a couple ideas. So don't hang up right, set, right, right when we cut this. All right, guys, take care. Have a, a great day. It's it's May in South Carolina and things is hot. Things is hot. They're heating up. So it's blessed. Uh, peace out. Heavy things lightly. We'll see you guys soon. Wow, Stephen Roach. Guys, how do we retain our identity and our integrity while also becoming deeply mm, relational? By entering into the world of another, wearing their shoes, do we become them? Well, the answer is, is no, but we're both. <laughs> and I don't care. You're never going to understand it. And I mean that you will become it because you're never going to understand it. And either am I, but you will become it. It's fascinating. This is the spiritual art pursuit of Theos. I don't know. It's just what it is. And I'm so thankful that in 2024, we can actually sit here and talk about it in a way that it's not, um, ain't nobody yelling at anybody. Because I don't think anger, and believe me, I'm angry plenty. I don't think anger, anger is ever a mark of piety. I do think standing still, holding tight to truth in the face of disintegration, some people might call that mean or something, but doing that is a mark of mark of sainthood, of the high things, a mark of theos. Anger. I think there's something like a righteous anger. Feels pretty rare in life, but maybe. Maybe we should get a lot of righteous anger going. <laughs> Stephen helps us today figure stuff out. I loved it. So, guys, 
Art of Tamada is a thing. I'm signing off by saying the one in Washington, by the time you see this, is probably filled up. But check it out anyway, because when this gets published, there might be some local tickets where if you want to go visit for the day and hang out, there's a ticket for that. And you can still join the table. Uh, there's a two-day ticket. There's even a three-day ticket with no with no hotel cost. Maybe you want to go stay at a, with a friend near Leavenworth. Do it. And you can get a reduction in the price. Remember, it is a donation to First Things. So if it goes like, hey, that's pretty expensive. Yeah, that's because you're also helping us. And that's how it works. Help. Love. Assistance. Thank you. Uh, last thing is... We finally got our two speakers. They all confirmed in Florida for the same event, Art of the Tamada. That is Jonathan Pajot joining Jordan Hall, both of them staying with us for the weekend. 25 tickets available down in Florida. Hope to see you guys there. This has been another edition of our wonderful series of conversations. Heavy things, lightly. Love to you all. Christe Agsda. Guys, Christe Agsda. Christ is risen. And if it's Pentecost already when you see this, eh, consider it a leftover. A little nugget of love. Peace out. Much love.